all of us are very, very lucky. We possess one of the most powerful brains in planet Earth. It's layers and layers that have been forming. At the core sits our reptilian brain. Our reptilian brain is responsible for our impulsive responses, our flight or fight kind of response. On top of that is our limbic system, and that is our emotional mind. And then our most sophisticated brain so far is our layer of neocortex, which allows us to think. I would propose that we are witnessing an amazing time in human history. We are actually witnessing the co-creation and co-evolution of our new digital brain. Every time we're searching on Google, trying to connect the dots on our own minds, finding those answers that will allow us to connect the dots, we are tapping into that digital collective brain. A few days ago, I was with a coworker on Skype, talking about a project, and I mentioned to him, OK, I'll email you this, so that way we'll remember. And the moment I said, we'll remember, I was like, wait a minute. So it is the same thing pretty much nowadays. And this was the realization I had. We are already at that level that if I can store something in a searchable way, it is pretty much the same as if I'm storing in my own head. And that's the level we are at. Of course, that's all true as, as long as technology works well. When technology doesn't work so well, there's something strange happens, that strange feeling of, I'm almost feeling sick. Like for me, if my cell phone doesn't have reception, it's a lot like I'm having a sore throat or my head hurts. <laughs> How many of you out there have experienced something similar? So it seems like I'm not alone. By the way, that cat, that wasn't my coworker. I just heard that every good internet presentation had to put a cat somewhere, so I, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> At the same time, every time you go into Facebook and you like something, every time you go into Facebook and comment on a post, if you go to a website and you help build the website, if you blog post, if you tweet, and all the other things that we all do on a daily basis, you are actually co-creating this collective digital brain. This merge between biology, biology sorry, and technology, it's going to augment us and expand us. In, in levels that we can't even imagine or predict. So let's explore. Let's explore exactly how different this new brain that we're going to be adding and layering into your, our current brains, and let's see how it's going to affect the future of how our capacities are going to be. One big difference that we're going to find is that our, our senses, the, our biological senses, are very personal individual in particular to each of us. But on the other hand, these global, um, these global senses that we are going to be acquiring are shared. They are collective. And they are actually formed collectively. When a group of people remotely connected are experiencing the Korean rapper, the gangman style song, everybody knows collectively that What's the horse stand dance, for instance? And that's because we have the shared experience throughout the net. I believe this shared experience is going to blur the line between what's private and what's public. And I know it's scary for some of us, but in a way, being transparent is going to be the new standard. Companies that are already going transparent and open in their networking, in their marketing, are the companies that are benefiting the most of the era of social networks. An example could be social marketing done by Starbucks that is pretty transparent compared with Chick-fil-A kind of faking and hiding profiles and things on Facebook. That was a recent incident you probably are aware of. The more you give to the net, the more transparent you are, the more value you're going to get back. And that's what's going to push transparency. It's not going to be just because. It's just because you'll get value out of it. Kevin Kelly, the author of the book What Technology Wants, talks about exosenses. Our senses, our five biological senses that we use every day, are local. They give us a local experience. Because we all are here in this room, we can hear, we can see whatever is happening right here, right now. With our new digital senses, we'll have the opportunity 
to have experiences that are distributed both in time and space. So what does it mean? For instance, I could see um, back in history, and we can all perceive how it felt for the first man to set foot on the moon, right? And that's something that happened in the past. We still can perceive it today very clearly. At the same, at the same time, there's things like um, maybe in the North Pole, a remote location that we cannot access right now, but we could see a video and see exactly what's going on in that place. Our exosenses are providing us experiences in 2D for the most part right now, but it will translate into 3D as we go into virtual worlds, as well as printing of 3D objects. But let's take this a step further. There's been research published August 2012 about a, a team that is, has hacked into the neural net on the retina of a mouse. And what they've done is, once they hacked into the code of that neural net, they could connect it and couple it to a digital camera. So what they ended up with is a mouse that had sight restored. So it was a blind mice that now can see to a certain extent. Of course, it's not going to be the resolution that we have on our biological eyes right now, but it's going to improve very fast. Can you imagine the possibilities? If you can connect an external camera, an external device, to your own mind, to your retina, to your neural networks that you already have, it will be like being able to turn a switch and switch from your biological site to your remote upgraded site. And you will be able to actually perform all sorts of upgrades. Maybe you have Zoom in. Maybe someone here in the audience, maybe John has like these extra features that nobody else has yet. And he has ultrasound vision, and he has also night vision. So there's all these things that are going to be endless possibilities. I wonder how many of you watch this movie Limitless, if you can show hands. Perfect. A few of you have. Well, I recommend all of you watch it, and especially the ones that already watch it, watch it again, looking for the potential that it has to show us how technology is going to improve. And through this biological and, di and digital brain, look at that again and watch how our capacities are going to be expanded and augmented incredibly. Another new trend that is going to change drastically our future are sensors. Our cell phones that we all carry in our pockets or purses, whatever, <laughs> uh, have at least 10, around 10 sensors each. A modern car holds about 100 sensors. Uh, a house has tens of sensors as well. It's estimated that a city of the size, medium-sized city like San Diego, would have billions of sensors at this time, right now, as we speak. Someone was talking about, uh, earlier about the sensors on the vines. And there's plants, household plants, that are going to have sensors and are going to be able to wireless transmit their humidity needs. So there's also light bulbs that are going to be connected through the internet, and, and those are called more like actuators and sensors because they can actually do something. There is going to be a lock for your front door that you're going to operate from your cell phone. There's, I mean, sensors are just starting. This is unleashing, and it's going to be exploding. It's going to be huge. You're going to be seeing the whole world coming alive through, connect, through connectivity. On, the, on, the, on a normal day, if I go out in the morning and look at the blue sky, with my biological sense, I would see a qualitative experience of um, light blue sky. But when I look at it with my digital senses, I will see a quantified experience, measurable, precise, verifiable by any other device in the industry that will tell me that that is a 4B, 8B, whatever it is, the number. Actually, in quantified, I like to say, too, that I use all these devices to quantify myself and to track my performance daily in different areas. For instance, this Fitbit thing, what it does is it tracks my every step. So I know how many miles I do a day, and I have an, an idea of how much exercise I'm getting. I also have this headband that I use to tell me how much sleep I'm getting at night, how much REM versus deep sleep I'm getting, actually. So am I really sleeping well? And I can track all these things together and figure out what little changes help me more. At the same time, I have a scale that is called WeThings, and the scale is connected to the internet. So that's my, the device that scares me the most, because if I go out of a range, it can tweet out to all my friends that I'm misbehaving. 
but no, it's, I don't really have it configured that way, but I could. And we're working on things like that, on helping behavior improve through devices. <laughs> All of these, when we talk about evolution, it used to be something very, very slow. It would happen throughout the years. But right now, when we're talking about technology evolution, it's just it's exponential. If you look at microprocessor speed, if you look at storage, if you look at, it doesn't matter where you look, you're always going to find these exponential curves that once they're triggered, I mean, there's nothing that is going to stop them. They're just going to go. Even for our representation of reality, we're finding those cur curves. And what it means to you is that things that if you were on your grandparents' time, you would think, oh, in 50 years, some things are going to happen. Well, right now, these things are going to happen in the next five or 10 years. Everything is going to happen faster and faster. By now, you might be wondering, oh my gosh, this looks like science fiction. <laughs> and you're talking about my new digital brain, but all these things are out there, right? But what the connection I'm trying to make is that even if now things are out there, computers are started in a full room out there, and then they moved into one desk in every home, right? And now we're going into one cell phone in every hand, in every pocket. And this is a tendency that is going to continue. It's going to be pervasive, it's going to be smaller every time, and it's going to get closer and closer to us, and in particular to our brains. The new trend that we're going to see out is visors, which is one of the first wearable devices that you're going to be very visibly. Actually, Google is launching their, their, their Google Glasses in April 2013 for developers. So you're going to start seeing people out there looking a little weird with glasses. And these glasses have them because they know a lot about you, because you're being transparent and open, the value you'll get is context, live context information, feedback on what's happening and what you need to know according to your preferences. The next step, which is already being researched, is brain-computer interfaces. And those are just reading your brains non-invasively from outside. But it's not going to stop there. From there, we're going to go into brain implants and things that are going to go inside your body. There's already an FDA-approved microchip that you can swallow, and it will measure in medicine and wirelessly connect to your doctor's office and do whatever it has to do. There's also a, a, a research being done with a paraplegic person, and the person is moving this mouse in a screen with their mind, just with their mind, and the same thing with a robotic arm. And maybe they're just moving a robotic arm with their minds. So we are getting very close to all this technology coming just fully integrated with our regular brains. It's just the direction it's going, and that's where it's going to be. So we have to start thinking that we're not going to be so much differentiating into, in between looking things out there or in our own brain. It's all going to be very integrated. I would like to leave you with two messages. One is for you as individuals. And as individuals, I want to tell you that technology comes in waves. And you have to be like surfers. You have to be there waiting to catch the right wave. And even if you don't catch the perfect wave, catch any wave, actually, because that will prepare you to be ready for the next. There's going to be a next wave, and that one you will be better positioned, positioned to actually catch. So don't be scared. Humanity has been scared of things that today are very obvious. Books, electricity, you name it. There's always a scare when there's change coming. But in the same way we develop these technologies, we do develop antibodies. We develop a system to combat whatever is going to come out that is not going to be nice. It all goes together. So we'll evolve the good and the bad all together and try to control the bad and make it emerge. Like we have done it with computer viruses, We've also done it with um, spam. As a community, my message is resistance <laughs> is futile. <laughs> and I know it's kind of a, it has a history of being an evil message. I don't mean it in that way at all. <laughs> I mean it in the way that this is going to happen. No, we can't stop it, but what we can do is direct it. We can drive it into an ethical, proper, following principles and uh, concentrating on what's best for whole humanity, developing those antibody systems so that it's safe. Let's just embrace it. I invite you to be a part of the conversation. I invite you to play this game. And more than all, embrace your new digital world. Embrace your new digital brain.
Thank you.